I'm just sitting here. I'm sitting here. We just thought we'd record the ramblings of Josh and Brian, but we're not really rambling, so it's just kind of like a weird... Uh, awkward silence. It's a silence, all right. I don't know if it's awkward. It's just silence. <laughs> well, for everybody else, it's awkward. Yeah, like when, well, I, when I'm with Brian, that's an odd thing anyway, because Brian likes to talk. He likes to have this... He never likes to have... Like, you don't really like the silence. You know... The reason why is I feel that I won't look qualified if I don't keep talking. I'll just be sure, honest. Sure, sure. And I've gotten I get better that. at it. But on this podcast, it's better if I say probably 40% less than less. what I do. And I should say like 30% more. And so it's like if we do that, mm. then we're like even. We have <laughs> we have, I also ha- We have come into our own. <laughs> I also have this habit, which I'm trying to break. Is where I like you say a joke, and then I comment on your joke. Now in real life, it's fine. On a podcast, it's really annoying. It is, yeah. But uh, that's how so, podcasts are. <laughs> like with the ums and ahs and everything, we edit out a lot. I think over the course of like the hundred and some episodes that we've done or whatever we've done now, we have gotten better speaking. Like you and I, just speaking in quote unquote podcast ease, kind of like talk, you know. Well, it's helped me in my real life. Sure. Yeah, I've it has. I've learned how much I say too. like or so or whatever it is. It's just the filler words. You just kind of cut them out. Like that filler words, like you don't need them when you're podcasting because people are only listening to you. If you're looking at you and you're having this visual distraction as well, I think the filler words actually are important because it's body language. Fair. With my stuff, when I talk, there's a, a patience I've had to go in when I start to strip out the filler words because it feels awkward to me. Sure. But nobody else perceives it as awkward. No, now, it's just you. Yeah. But where it is awkward, <laughs> I watched this interview with Elon Musk and asked him a question, and it was about 30 seconds. The homie was sitting there saying nothing. <laughs> he was thinking, and he gave a really good answer at I think the end of it. part of that, too, is that Elon is <coughs> autistic, so he's kind of like, he really is in himself a lot. And he mm-hmm. wants to, when he speaks, he wants it to be meaningful. So Fair. he's really thinking about that. I mean, I do the same thing sometimes where I'll sit there and just kind of zone out for a second. And I I know people are like, are you, are you like alive? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the concern for me is that people would misunderstand me. And look. Yeah. Some of it, too, is learning how to communicate functionally. But I think another part of it for me growing up was I had to fight a little bit harder to just have people listen to me just for what I'm saying, you know, where this is a situation where I overcorrected when I didn't feel like I was being heard or I was being minimized, where I had to, like, overspeak. I had to overexplain. So that people really got what I was, where I was coming from, or they would feel my emotions themselves because this is how I felt. That's that you go through your own arc as you get into your adulthood and stuff like that. But those things now, it's you don't need to, and if you do, it actually can be drawn out by saying less. I'm very different in my mus- musical life. I say as little as I can on the bass most often, and people, man, man, like. You played so tastefully. It's like, well, I could say a lot more, right. but I don't want to say any more. I actually want to say less. I'm, I'm trying to make it so I say less. And I'm trying to bring that into this podcast it, life it, also. It's the, uh, a f- it's the old adage, less is more, where you leave people wanting. And I think like if you leave people wanting, that's good. But why do people... Here's a the question then. Why do people want... I guess, does it ring out they, if they really want to know more? So it does because, like, okay, so I want to take this example of, like, Star Wars, right? People wanted more Star Wars for years, right? They wanted more movies. They wanted more, and we got the movies, and then people were like, oh, these aren't that great, or they're not as good as we thought they would be because it's in your mind. Now, the trick is, though, to give people what they need, and not what they want, 
It's also to give them what they don't know they need. And so it takes a true visionary to do that. You know, like somebody like Steve Jobs with an iPhone. An iPhone, there was no concept of a phone like that before he came out with one saying, oh, here's what you guys want. You want a capacitive screen. You want this. You want apps to do everything for, you know, driving that forward. Once that was laid out, everyone was like, oh, this is exactly what we wanted. But no one knew it until it was presented to them. So it takes true visionaries, like true people to move mediums and people forward. But then other people pile on very quickly and like kind of flesh it out. And there's value to that. Tim Cook wouldn't have been the right person to invent the iPhone. That's not his skill set. Right. He has li- he has built a complete empire out of Apple. That is his skill set. Right. And that's why I think the partnership with Jobs and him was really excellent in that they did what they were good at. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of things in a lot of a lot of place things. It doesn't always it's giving you what you what you actually need, not what you want. And it's giving you what you want in the context of what you need, too. It's it's a very weird balance, I think. I don't think everyone is on board with it all the time. And that's why some things fail at certain times. But then, like, five years later, they'll take off and just the same concept. So can you give an example of something where you said very little and people were all over you and they understood you? And then another time, or, or maybe you just you tell the time when you said it like, oh, it's like this, and people completely took it wrong. Like, what? Which one generally goes correct for you? It really depends correct? on context. Like, if... So the way I think mostly it happens is it's almost like planting a seed, right? It's like, I think it should go like this. And it and a lot of people will be like, eh, I don't really think so. And I'll listen to them and I'll be like, okay, what are you like? What's your objection? And a lot of times the objection is emotional. It's not like logical. And so I'll say to somebody, okay, so what's the problem? Like, give me the real world problem. Like, why why do you have a problem with my idea? Now, I'm not always the best at everything. I mean, I'll be totally honest with, with that. Like, I, my ideas are sometimes crap. But when I know I have a good idea that's going to work, but then I'm getting, I'm getting pushback because it's just a, it's a feelings thing. And people are like, oh, you're you're like throwing my idea away. No, I'm not throwing your idea away. I'm just saying maybe if we twist your idea a little bit and we combine a little bit of this, isn't that better? And I think once they get there logically, then there a lot of people are like, oh, it's that whole thing we always talk about. Like, don't make anything your baby. I think that people have ideas and people are very passionate about their ideas. They like creative things are from you. Like you take a part of yourself to do it. You know, like CC, like if somebody came in and told Brian and I, CC is great, but we could do this, this, and this. Now, I think we'd be to this point now because we've done this for so long. We'd be like, yeah, that might be good. We'll try it. But I think if they would have done that like episode like four, we might just told them to pound sand. Or be so malleable where we just would have, would do it and then not think about it because right. they maybe were more experienced or something. Exactly. And so like, I think that's part of it too. It's, Obviously, your personality means a lot. Like, can you take the criticism? Can you take... And we we got that into that with the Rascal Magic guys. And they love criticism, but they love constructive criticism. They don't want somebody to just come up to them and say, uh, your idea is crap. <laughs> and not give it a reason. Yeah. Right? I I think it's fair if somebody came up to me and said, hey, this is really crappy. And this is why. There's three things wh- that why. And I, like that's something we can pick apart, right? We can actually explore. And so I feel that like a lot of things with what I do is when, when that happens to me. I don't know if that happens to you. Well, let me think about this for a minute. I know I didn't actually answer your question, but. That's okay. No, it's, well, here's what it did And these do. are on episodes, so we can just say whatever we want. <laughs> We're going to drop in at this point right now, and people are going to say, what are they talking about? I think that when I, well, let me go back up. Part of me, when I look at how decisions are made, and I've made my own emotionally driven decisions, 
Many people don't make logical decisions. No, 99% are emotional. So how do you bridge when you're trying to present something rational and you have to emotionally appeal? This is, this is a big communication. This is a larger conversation for an episode, but there's an art. Yeah, there there's is. not a direct science to it. It is a how do I... And I'm good at get... it. <laughs> so t- talk about how you socialize an idea that is maybe inherently unpopular, but is actually correct and good and right. I know this is going to sound. It. I know. I know this is going to sound kind of bad because, like, this is going to sound like I don't care what other people say, but I really do. But I know when I'm right about a process, okay? Like a lo, like a logistical process. I know when I'm right about that, and that's something that I'm not right about everything. I I am not. I mean, I have lots of fallacies, lots of things I'm wrong about, but. Like if it's a lot, if it's like a logistical process that is in my wheelhouse, I'm right. I'm 99% right about how to do something with that. And when somebody comes up to me and says, no, I really want to do it this way. Though I pick apart, like I have gotten to the point now where I am not, I don't go, are you freaking kidding me? You know, I, I would, I would look at them and say, okay, let's look at this. Like, why do you think your way is going to work? And I'll have them tell me. And a lot of times they'll be like, well, because we do it this way and this way works better. I said, yeah, but I already tweaked that process already. I already looked at what you were saying was wrong and I fixed it. And now we're doing the new process. So isn't this way better in that context? Now, a lot of times people have to be like kind of drug across the finish line, kicking and screaming. <laughs> it's just the way it is until they see the result. And I even will say to them a lot of times, look, let's just try it this way. And if this is not working or if I even feel like your way is has a remotely chance of like doing this better, even like some of the process better, let's fix it. So I do that a lot with like a lot of the volunteer stuff I do where I am. I am in charge of the, like some of the volunteer stuff I do because I have done it for so many years. I know how stuff, I know what works in reality. I know what looks good on paper that doesn't always work. And almost every year I have to deal with people that bring in their expertise. And I do that in quotes because they've never actually done it. You know? So what is their expertise then? Why are they defining that? So, for example, somebody that is, I'll just use the food drive as an example in Inglewood. I, I coordinate that food drive every year. That's hundreds of people with the goal of collecting food, right? And there are certain food drives. Now, I let the food drive food banks, we have four food banks in Inglewood, I let them take care of their own processes. However, when we get to the point of picking up the food, dealing with uh the logistics of getting the food from where it's going to their place, that's my that's my wheelhouse. And so a lot of times they'll say, oh, no, this is going to work better. This is why I'll be like, no. And I tell them right out, this is what works because this is the real world process we've done this with hundreds of times. If you want to do it that way, this is not volunteering for you. And... I'll get I get zero pushback from all the coordinators of the food pantries because of the five coordinators that really coordinate with me. They know <laughs> that if we just do it this way, it's going to work. And usually about half a day in, I'll get phone calls from people if they've had and they'll say, you know, push back and they'll say, you're right. This way works really good. But then I even I always open it up and say, hey. I'm going to try that next year. I'm going to try incorporating some of what you said. And I do. I do tweak my processes all the time. However, the overall process is always uh, one I know will work. Because at the end of the day, it's not always the prettiest solution. It's the one that works. And sometimes it's, it's people have an idea. And it's better. But it just doesn't work in the context of working with other people. You've said so much in that little bit. <laughs> I know, right? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna add one darn thing. You could just take that section, <laughs> and we're gonna make that a whole episode. I think.
Yeah, why not? It, I mean, that's just like this un episode is almost the un episode of an episode, you know? <laughs> yep. Please edit this, Josh. Like beginning, if you hear me saying this comment, it means he left this comment in. However, I think the second half of this conversation is actually where we drop folks in so they hear yeah, this part of it. I think so. Because, all right. Thanks, folks, for tuning in to the, uh, the, the intellectual throat clearing of Josh and Brian on this episode, <laughs> on episode of Curiosity Continuum. We'll see you next time, folks.